Welcome back to Inclusive Design 24 2022, brought to you in partnership with our Platinum supporters, Intopia and Fable, and our Gold supporters, Barrier Break, TPGI, and UX for the win. You can follow us on Twitter at ID24Conf, and if you have questions for the presenter, which I hope you do, tweet them using the ID24 hashtag or post them in the YouTube chat, and we'll scoop those up for the Q&A at the end of the session. I am pleased to see that I have been joined by Lee Dale as the guest host. Over to you, Lee. Thanks so much, Adrian. Uh, it's great to be here, and I'm excited to hear from Stephanie Walter on the topic of a designer's guide to documenting accessibility. Steph shared with me her inspiration for the talk, which is that there's this idea out there that accessibility is something to be fixed at the end of a project, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Really excited to, to hear where Steph takes this. Take it away. Yay. So thanks for having me. I will just cut the camera to keep some bandwidth for the, the slides because it's like 10 p.m. here and I think my neighbors are enjoying Netflix. So welcome to a designer's guide to documenting accessibility and user interactions. I'm Stephanie Walter. I'm a UX researcher and UX designer. I live and work in Luxembourg. Um, and I've like more than 12 years of experience working on, with different projects in web agency, a university, and today I'm a consultant. So I kind of specialize in enterprise UX, which means I come to company and help them build better tools for their employees. So as Lee explained, uh, today, a lot of websites were sadly not designed or even developed with accessibility needs in mind. And as designers, unfortunately, a lot of us think, yeah, accessibility is the job of the developer team. So accessibility tends to become kind of an afterthought in projects. Company, they launch inaccessible projects and team get asked to fix the accessibility at the end of the project. A little bit like this picture. So this is a picture of my glasses <laughs> two years ago that get broken down. And I had fun trying to repair them with uh, gl um, glitter duct tapes. And of course, it didn't work. So my question is, why fix it later uh, when you could design and build it right to start with? And this is why I think we need to bring accessibility awareness earlier in the project. When everyone becomes responsible, responsible for the accessibility, most issues can be identified and fixed early. And I think that guidelines and documentation are great tool to help us achieve that. So let's talk about designer documentation. And the first question I'm gonna ask is how and where can I document accessibility and interaction as a designer? I'm going to give you examples from my project. So I will explain a little bit kind of the um, the structure of the project. So I'm a designer in a team with uh, only developers, QA and PMs, and we use Sketch. Um, we have two files. Um, we have a component library, which is a Sketch file where I can kind of put all my components in there and I document on my components in there. And then those components, they get used as a Sketch library to build um, pages. Uh, so I have this one library, and then I'm just using it as, as Lego block to build full pages. And then both of those um, get some links into Jira tickets. So if we are working on a component, we link the component. If we are working on pages, we usually link the page and the component documentation. And I document a lot using annotation, which means I will put some little dots, arrows and stuff on top of my um, actual design. On the left on my screen, you have an example of a detailed documentation for a search filter. So this is a little <laughs> a compl a complex component already because it has a lot of different states. And you have in the background the component itself. And on top of it, you have some little pink arrows and some text and some little drop uh, some little um, other arrows for the keyboard navigation. So this is what I mean when I say we document using annotation, which is on top of the component, we have a lot of different states and we try to explain to the dev team what's expected in here from 
accessing and using this component with um, mouse to keyboard navigation. And for that, what I did is actually created some sketch symbols, uh, which is, uh, so in sketch, a symbol is a, a re reusable component. So it means that all of those arrow and little stuff, I can just drag and drop them on the page to gain a little bit um, of time. Then this is the documentation at page level. So um, I have my components and I'm using them in a final page. And here I have an example. I grade out the sensible data, but it's basically one page where I have the regular page at the top. And then again, at the bottom, I have this page with a uh, big uh, flashy uh, pink documentation on top, of it, on top of it for different areas. And my advice here is um, you want to have a way of having documentation that will stand out to make sure that developers will not implement that. So here it's pink and magenta, which is not part of the brand identity of this product, which means that uh, at some point dev gets used to it and they know that, yeah, this is documentation, this is not to be implemented. While preparing this talk, I stumbled upon Karen Hawkins. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, and she has some accessibility annotation example that I find quite interesting. So what she has here on the left is uh, the mockup of the page. And on top of it, she put some little bottles with uh, some numbers. And each number has a very specific documentation. And the interesting part is that there's like black documentation, which is for the regular um, requirement. And then she has a red documentation that is prefixed with AR for accessibility documentation. So for every one of those, she has often kind of both like regular and then accessibility requirements. So here, Karen, I uh, showed you how Karen does it. I showed you how I document. What you need to understand is if you want your documentation to be useful and used, ask the team about what would work for them. There are many different <laughs> formats I can imagine for documentation like Jira ticket, Confluence or whatever knowledge base you're using. Um, I know some people use Figma comments to document directly or some put separate documentation in Word files, PDF, Excel sheet. I think I've seen it all <laughs> by now. So my advice here is, Talk to your team and understand what best format works for them if you want this documentation to be um, used. And it has to be an open discussion. And then the second point is, remember what one thing, this is not a substitute for talking to people. So it's really, really important to present actually this documentation, to present the mockups as a designer in person if you can. So in my team, what we have is a weekly meetings that uh, we call clarification meetings. So this is uh, once a week, an hour, and it's the time for the developers to show us what they developed. But it's also the time for me to show them what I have in mind for um, kind of big pages and components and stuff like that. And then we can align and discuss about how it's supposed to work and then if it's not going to work probably I can always kind of adjust if needed so okay I've shared the how <laughs> I shared I shared the where let's dig a little bit further with actual examples so what exactly can or should a designer document when it comes to accessibility to help us navigate this I've split those into four different categories we will talk about visual design, interactions, wayfindings, and announced content and markup. So usually the first things that come in mind when we talk about visual design and accessibility is the color palette. Uh, so in this example, I have a color palette with um, blue and uh, red dominant colors, and then I have the grays. And what I did in here, I documented um, each and one of those uh, colors against a white background. So this is to answer the question, can I use this uh, blue as a button with a white text, or can I use this as text on top of a white background or something like that? So this is a good start. The issue here is that I'm only comparing those colors to white or a black background. Sometimes I, lead a, I need a little bit more. And when I need a little bit more, I can bring something that is a matrix. Um, so there's a link on Twitter, or I think it will be in the YouTube channel that has uh, my slides. And you'll have all um, the, the different tools I present today in there. So don't worry, you'll get access to this, um, this tool. So here, um, I have two axes. I have vertical and horizontal axis. And on both of those, I have uh, my colors. 
And then at the intersection of this, I have the contrast ratio that would happen if I were to use those two colors together. So if I take yellow, for example, on the, on the white, if I want to have like white text on top of yellow background, this is not possible because it's a very, very small uh, 1.3 contrast ratio. So if I want to use this yellow, I could use it um, with uh, maybe a dark gray or something like that. Then I got a sufficient contrast ratio. So this kind of feelings, it helps me remember what colors I can use together. And also it helps other designers on the project know as well. One important thing about designers though, is that not all of us are familiar with the concept of contrast ratios and even the concept of double A and triple A. Um, so at some point, you might need to explain that to designers, explain to them why CAC. And there's a lot of awesome resources. And for the, um, uh, the colors, I really like uh, Geri's website uh, where she explained uh, basically the use of the color and um, all the AA, A, double A and AAA things. So I would say if your designers don't know anything about color and accessibility, this is also kind of a, a good place to start and a way to teach them um, how this is supposed to work. Then next category is interaction documentation. So for interactive components, uh, it's a little bit tricky because you design in tools where you're basically pushing pixels, but you have to imagine how those are going to behave when someone will interact with them. And when I say interact with them, it can be with different pointers. It can be with a mouse, it can be with a keyboard, it can be with a screen reader or um, voice assistant, something like that telling um, the where you want to point on the screen and a lot of different interactions. So for button, for in instance, here on the left, um, in my example, I have some orange button and I'm documenting default hover, focus, active and disabled state for um, each one of this. Focus is quite important for accessibility because it helps keyboard users know where they are when they navigate on the page. For more complex things like checkboxes or radio button, I might need a few extra ones. So for checkboxes, I have default focus checked, disabled, disabled checked. So you see if someone's checked it, but somehow it got disabled, you can't uncheck it. And I have something that doesn't exist in uh, HTML, but I often need with like big tables and stuff like that, which is an indeterminate state. And for the radio button, it's basically the same. I just don't have the indeterminate. So this is the kind of stuff that um, we are going to provide to developers so they know exactly all the states. And this is at com component level. For form inputs, I might need a little bit more. So I have the generic one. I have default, focus, field, read only or disabled. But then once someone interacts with an input field, something might happen to the data. So I could have other uh, statuses. I might need an error status. I might need a success if they fix the error. Or I might just need an information or something like that. So those are the three at the bottom of the screen here. And for those, what I need to do is I can't just use color to convey the information. Otherwise, uh, colorblind people might have a problem. So here I have a mix between a border, a color, an icon, and a small little message to make it um, quite clear. And then when I use these components, I can't just put like message. <laughs> this will not be enough. Developer need to know exactly what is the error message. So often for those, uh, I need two things. I need the trigger, which is what is the case? when is this error going to be triggered? And then I need the exact error message. So the copy that should be displayed in here. Okay, let's focus on more complex components because the error messages were just too simple, you know? So when I have like complex components, I built something that I called interactive flow. So inter an interactive flow is a documentation of how the component should work when there are different interactions. So I usually start with the mouse. In this example, it's again my filter components with checkbox. So you have a status in a table or somewhere, and when the user clicks on it, it will open a list of checkboxes and they can choose to check or uncheck some of those, and then they can apply. So I'm documenting step-by-step step what happens when a user open a filter, hovers an element, checks a filter box, hits the apply button, things like that. 
And then on top of most interaction, I also usually, uh, when I have time, try to document keyboard interaction. So I end up with this kind of double flow at the top. I have the most interaction and then I have the um, keyboard interaction at the bottom of it, which is the equivalent, like how to open the component, enter space, how to close it, escape, how to navigate across the different elements, up and down keys, how to check a box, et cetera, et cetera. So sometimes you might also build some keyboard uh, shortcuts into your components. So mine don't, but this is also something that you could document at some point. Like if the user can save whatever they're doing on the page by hit hitting control S for save, maybe you can document that as well. When it comes to interactions, if you have complex gesture, so this applies more for mobile, um, an, an accessibility guideline, but also good usability practice is uh, to have an alternative photos. So if I were to document, for instance, uh, the Gmail um, Android application, uh, there's kind of a hidden feature where when you swipe on the, on the left on a message, it will archive it. First, not a lot of people will discover it. And second, it's a, complex, it's a complex gesture. So for that, I could have a few alternatives. So here in the middle, one alternative would be to long press on it. And when you long press on an element here, it will have the little uh, toolbar at the top that um, will be displayed. And then you can hit the archive button. Another alternative for this complex gesture is to open the actual email, and then you have the toolbar that is always visible at the top, and then you can archive it from here. So it doesn't have to be a lot of different things. It's just that if you have a complex gest, you need a second way to do that. Another thing is uh, Zoom behavior. So for responsive pages, uh, I can document that. So one of the guidelines is you may need to make sure that it's going to display properly, even uh, at 200%. So I'll be honest, this is something I don't always um, provide when I do responsive uh, web design because we as developers do not block the Zoom and then we will test that sort of things. But I think it can be quite interesting, especially if you're building native applications, maybe to, the, to um, document that as well. So this is documentation uh, from a friend of mine who documented a, a FAQ page um, on the bank application or no, insurance application. And on the left is how the button can behave at 100%. And then on the right, how are they going to behave and change if the user zooms to 200%. Then one aspect of design that is quite tricky and fortunately to document is animations and transitions. And there are also accessibility best practices and guidelines for those. You need to know that some animation might trigger motion sickness to users with vestibular disorders and other uh, disabilities. And I'm one of those. There's a lot of video games I can't <laughs> play because of the motion sickness. So regarding interface, what you can do is you can use a media query code prefers reduced motions to provide an alternative version uh, for people who prefer less um, um, motion. So on my website, I have my face and I have this uh, fox, some coffee and sushi floating around my face. And then if you scroll down, there's a growing animation of a plant. And this one might be triggering. So what I have here is if the users um, hits the reduce motion preference in the system, I don't have any animation on my face anymore. Like the stuff are not dancing around my head anymore. And then I replace the growing plant animation that might be an issue with something a little bit more smooth that is uh, just a fade in to appear on the screen. So it doesn't mean you need to remove the animation. It just means that maybe you need to provide something that is less triggering. Uh, the trick here is to document animations. So usually they build directly in collaboration with the developers in the browser. So here I would say this is one of those cases where it's really, really hard to document something. Maybe you could describe how the animation is supposed to work, but this is something where you will do some kind of designer, developer, peer program designing things and discuss this directly and fine tune in the browser. Also don't forget, uh, if you have things that play automatically, they need to have a play and pause button in your interface. Like if you have videos or sliders that are auto playing. So let the user control things if they want to play it or not, try to avoid the auto playing things. 
the last uh, documentation I can provide at, uh, for interaction is actually interaction across pages. Um, here on the left, we have something that uh, I call user flows. So user flows, they are kind of step-by-step box and arrow graphs that document how someone can accomplish a task in an interface. And they will list pages or views if you're on mobile, but also branches like, uh, does the user have an account? Yes, then they log in, no, then they have to go through the creating account process, something like that. So this is a branching. Uh, they're usually built at the beginning of the project and those are deliverable I give to developers, but also testing teams because they help them uh, um, see how the pages are going to behave. Um, then I have here on the right something that is called screen flow. It's basically the same as user flow, but instead of having the abstract box and um, little um, triangles and stuff, I put the actual mockups on top of this. So those, since I need the actual mockups, they usually be built at the end of the project. Once we went through usability testing, refinement, and we have the final mockups. And both help the developer team understand uh, how a user will navigate across the interface. And when it comes to accessibility, it can help plan a few things. First, again, just talk to you about animation, be careful about that. But sometimes you might want to have transitions between pages, especially if you have a single page application. So make sure those don't trigger motion sickness, but seeing like what pages come next and before can help, like this sort of documentation can help you decide on that. Also, if you have like alerts or messages that might appear at the top of the page and they need to be persistent across the whole flow, things like that. And then they can also help you uh, plan ses session length. Uh, if you have like a multiple step, um, again, uh, check out for instance. So, the best practice is don't uh, limit the session. Let user have all the time in the world they want to fill your form. But if you really must uh, have a session, then uh, be careful about that and make sure you give them enough time. And yes, yeah, seeing kind of the whole flow just lay down flat helps you kind of prepare those kind of things. Then next category is wayfinding, which is uh, we will help people find their way aka uh, navigate across our pages and inside the page. Let's start with page title. And by page title, I mean the actual HTML title. So it's used for SEO, yeah. <laughs> but it's also displayed in the tabs, um, browser tabs at the top. And one important thing is that it is announced by screen readers. So this one will help users know where they are and what they can expect to find on that page. This is why it's super important that it's a good title that is descriptive and not deceptive for users. Um, our documentation for that is uh, a Jira ticket. We have a giant Jira ticket where we have um, an example of the structure of um, all the HTML page title that we expect because we have a enterprise interface. So those are basically like built on the, um, on the fly based on operation or contract names. So, so in here, I only have the structure. If you have kind of a smaller website, you can also document this directly in the mockups if you want. Then another thing designer can document is the skip link. So a skip link is a link that will let screeny the users skip directly to the main content of the page. Uh, sometimes you can also let them skip to uh, the search. It can be interesting too. So they are often invisible, but not always by default. So it means you don't see them on the page until you start navigating through the tab key and then they get the focus. And as I said, they will be announced by the screen reader. So what you can document here is where the skip link here is, sorry. So here at the top left corner of my cooking recipe page, what it looks like when it's focused. So I have a outline, a red outline plus a um, dark browser one, and then where it will send the user, which is here to the main contents. So the skip link was sending my user to the main, uh, kind of a, an area that is called main. But you have a lot of other interesting area that you can um, document on the page. And those are called our area <laughs> landmarks. So with the help here maybe of an accessibility expert, you could also document those. So here uh, on my screen, I have kind of an inception, which is the area landmark 
page that is showing its own area landmark. So I have a banner, I have main, I have navigation, region, things like that. So again, here those can be interesting because they help uh, screening the users um, get a first sense of the structure of a page. So you can document this as well as designers, maybe again with the help of accessibility experts and developer here. Once the user is ins inside your page, uh, proper HTML headings, I mean H1, H2, and H3 is also super important. So here to help, I can do two things. First, I usually uh, directly name my style with the proper heading level. So you have that in my example here in Figma on the right, which is I have uh, H1s, I have H2s, I have a different levels of H3s uh, that are maybe centered or left, things like that. And then on the mockups directly, I can again use my little annotation to document this. So I have here a mobile cooking recipe website. The H1 is supposed to be at the top of the page with the name of the recipe, then ingredients gets H2, preparation step H2, step watch one um, H3, et cetera, et cetera. Um, some people navigate a website with a mouse. Some might use tabulation key. So in this case, the focus order should follow kind of the logic of the flow of the page. Um, so focus order is something I could document at page level. So again, on a very simple page, such documentation might be overkill. Um, here, it's an example from a Figma template that is from the Fluent design system, so a team at Microsoft. And they provide a whole Figma kit if you're interested uh, for uh, those animations. So they use the kind of annotation on top of the mockup technique. They have the mockup in the background. And on top of it, they have small annotation with uh, numbers that will um, tell developer what's the focus order expected for this page. So the uh, if you navigate this using uh, tabulation, you should first go through all the links in the uh, not red, sorry, a green header at the top. Then you kind of enter the second zone in the middle. You then enter the navigation and um, Strangely enough, you don't go straight to the content. You have uh, this one at the bottom of the page that I think it's a backlink first, and then only then do you enter the top of the content and the actual tables of the content. So by just looking at the number here, as a developer, I would know what's the expected focus order for all this page. Uh, you can also document this at the um, component level. So here I have a small form. And this form is on two columns. So here I could document um, what's, again, the focus order expected. I want the users to go through the column on the left first and then to go on the right side. So they should go through who are you, then what is your request about your email at the, bot at the um, bottom left, then go on the right column, your message, and uh, send the email. Um, if you're in Figma, there's one interesting plugin for that. It's called the Accessibility Focus Order. And it's really nice because then you can just select the elements, uh, you give it a number, and then it will generate the documentation that you can complete. So that can make you gain a little bit of time when documenting such things. The last category uh, we'll talk about is uh, documenting content and markup. So if you have images or icons in the mockup, uh, designers can also document what the assistive technology is supposed to announce. Here I have again an example of a cooking recipe website with a big image of a slice of pizza in the, um, in the top of the page. Um, I use the annotation technique on top of my mockups with a little number one. And then I have my little number one on the right that says alt text, slice of pizza with a lot of melted cheese, tomato sauce, ham, and grilled olives. I think the melted cheese is important because people need to, be, to know about the melted cheese. The goal is to make them want to try the recipe. So yeah, anyway, this one gets an uh, alternative text. Uh, but then at the right of uh, this image, I have tr three little buttons, save, share, and uh, rate. Each button has a label, but it also has an icon. So here in my documentation, what I'm basically saying is those should not have an alternative text because otherwise it will be quite annoying if the screen reader would um, read an alternative uh, for the icon and then read save. So it 
kind of brings uh, information twice. Since I have a label, I don't really need uh, those to be announced. So I can say, okay, I don't need those to be announced. Since I don't know how my developer is going to implement this, I don't kind of say how what I expect, but maybe we could talk about empty alt or role representation, something like that. So again, the implementation here is left to the developer. The only thing I'm saying is, yeah, this should not announce anything. And one small detail <laughs> here, I assume that you are building the pages yourself, but if you are not building a cooking recipe page, but kind of a portal that is letting people enter their own cooking recipe pages and they can enter an image, then you need to provide an, a way for them to uh, enter an alternative text. So here I have a screenshot of um, the WordPress uh, editor when I add an image, then I can uh, use an alternative text. Um, I will not go into the detail, but if you're interested, there's something that is called uh, ATAG, which is Offering Tool Accessibility Guideline that deals with all this part, which is uh, how do you build uh, tools for people to build <laughs> the websites like WordPress, things like that, and make sure like those tools provide the necessary accessibility um, requirements as well. So, uh, here I have another example where I actually need to have something for the alternative text because I have a tile and at the top right of the tile, you can switch between uh, the graph view and the table view. And here I just have this uh, selector that only has icons. So here I'm using again the annotation technique to say the first one should say view graph and the second one should say view table. Um, one thing I can document is the announced content order. This is interesting if the visual order might be different from the HTML flow. Please note that most of the time you want the same order. So this you might want to be super careful um, with. So I have an example of the right of uh, my cooking recipe um, website, but here it's not the full page, it's kind of a card. This card is going to be used in, I don't know, like uh, search results, for instance. The card has an image at the top and on top of this image, I have uh, the save button. Then I have categories underneath it, the big title H1, and then I have um, a summary. So here, I first don't want the image to be announced because if it's in a search result, most of the image will say, yeah, uh, slices of pizza, something like that. So it might be a little bit annoying. The important detail here is even if the save is at the top visually, there's a, a good chance um, I want it uh, at the bottom of my, of my HTML. So what I want uh, as an um, announce order is first the title, gluten-free uh, pan pizza, because it's big. Visually, it's big, so I want to reflect that in the order as well. Then the categories. Third, I want the summary. And then at the end, I want the save. But again, here it's a very specific case because I basically put the save on top of the image uh, to gain some space. Most of the time, you will want the same order in your um, announced order than the one that you have in your design. Another thing. Uh, with my design is sometimes I might have clickable area, but it's not always obvious for the developers to know, okay, what part of that is supposed to be the link. And then I can document that as well. So here I have a um, tile um, with a few uh, different, uh, what we call is a list item basically, which has a name, a number, a little arrow and a little icon. And here what I'm documenting is basically telling my developer the whole thing must be clickable. So the link is not on the arrow, it's not on the, um, the title, is on the whole um, little element. Sometimes screen reader users also need some extra information. So I have again a very specific example here where we have notification badges. Um, I have a little uh, red dot with a number in it to say to the user, oh, you have five tasks or maybe you have five new documents. And here, we could announce that because if the screen reader only says five, it might be a little bit misleading. So we could have something where the screen reader would say something like no new documents um, if there's no notification, five new documents in my document if you have five, no new tasks, uh, five new tasks in my task if you have five, something like that. So again, this is a very specific case where I wanna make sure that um, 
the per person using a screen reader has the kind of same level of information as someone who can actually see the notification and then understand that the little number on the corner is a notification. So those were mostly design documentation, but if you work with developers and accessibility experts, you can go beyond that. You can document even more things like create HTML semantic elements. Should we have a button or should this be a link? Area role, area states, properties, things like that. So for example, if I have an accessibility expert to help me, I could document the correct HTML5 type. Uh, in the middle here, I have a date range and I'm just saying to the developer, okay, look, we are going to use the browser um, input type equal date so that we have kind of the date picker for free, which is also awesome. No JavaScript needed here. Uh, for the select box, we are just saying, you know what, again, use the HTML um, option so that we get it uh, the default browser one. And then the type uh, equals search for my little um, search filter at the top of uh, the page. So this is, again, usually you go into that level of kind of code documentation if you have developers to help you or if you are kind of proficient um, with code. Then access to external documentation can be provided if you need something more. Like for instance, you can't really put uh, the audio transcripts into the, your mockups or the caption for your video. So here, usually what we do is we basically have a link to the place where we store the transcript, where we store the um, SRT files, things like that. So who should document all of this? I said it was designers, but Honestly, it's a team effort and uh, it usually depends. So I think a lot of people can help with such documentation, like product manager, for instance. They should at least document accessibility requirement at project level and put accessibility guidelines as part of the definition of done and definition of ready. Designers, they can document all the things I just showed you. Developers, accessibility experts, they can document kind of the technical implementation, correct markup, ARIA roles, landmarks. If you're working with content UX writers, maybe they can help with alternative text, with uh, buttons, with error messages, things like that. And then we have QI or the testing team, and they will actually have to test the pages. So you need to make sure that they will also test keyboard navigations and things like that. So they have to participate too. So my advice here is uh, start with what you, your team members are comfortable with and then build upon this basis. So while preparing this talk, I did kind of a fun exercise. I tried to organize what I can document on my own, what I need the help of my developer to document and what I would like to have the help of SEO people or content writers. So I built this kind of free area metrics where I put everything that I put in my talk and I have some stuff where it's a little bit in the middle because I can document part of it on my own, but I still need developers. And I think it can be an interesting exercise, which would be try to map um, for your team the different levels of expertise and what people feel most comfortable with when it comes to documentation. Then a uh, final question is often, when do you document all of this? And the answer is uh, once the components of the page are final and they're tested. So I'll always have a discussion with the developer to know if this is uh, we can do it technically. And then if we need to rework, I will rework it before documenting it. Otherwise, you will waste a lot of time. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is uh, how do you sell that? <laughs> to your team, like how do you convince the team to invest? And to convince them, we need to make them understand the benefits of such documentation. So a few reasons. First, it benefits myself as a designer. In order to prepare this talk and in order to document all of this, I had to learn about accessibility and I have to keep up to date as a designer on those uh, very specific things. So it benefits me to become a better designer. Also, it forces me to think kind of about different interaction beyond this static pixel I'm working on. Documenting is a really nice mental effort that forces you to take a step back and ask yourself, okay, how will someone... Uh, interact with a mouse, with a keyboard, will this actually work when we start like seeing the picture of not just the pixel on the screen, but really imagining interactions. And sometimes it will work, sometimes it won't. And then if you discover while doing that, that it won't, you can rethink a different solution. 
it also benefits uh, my designer and developer collaboration. So the documentation, you might think it takes time for the designer, but what you have to understand is anything that is not documented is something that the developer will have to ask to the designer or they have to come up with themselves. So it's actually kind of a gain of time to document such things. And also it helps avoid misinterpretations. Sometimes they might be four or five months between the moment I showed something to the developers during those meetings and the moment the driver tickets arrived on their backlog. And even if we talked about that before, having this documentation is kind of also good reminders and a new conversation starter as to what is expected. It helps bring consistency to future pages and interactions. So sometimes I do something and then my developer will come and ask like, Stephanie, this, uh, we have another component that is kind of the same. It works like that. Why does this new component not work the same way? I'm like, ha, you're right. It should actually work the same way. So yeah, kind of a, a good check as well. Then it also benefits uh, other designers. So as I said, it's a good onboarding tool for any new designer who don't know anything about accessibility because it will kind of um, bring a conversation on the table and kind of help them learn and understand what's expected. Also, you have this kind of prior documentation that helps set some standards for what is expected then once they work with you as a designer. So it helps again, bring consistency in the design team and help the designer grow. And then it will benefit everyone. At some point, it starts a conversation about accessibility within the company and encourages people to dig a little bit further. So instead of seeing accessibility as something we can fix at the end of the project, no, you can start shifting it to the left and kind of having this as a, a way um, to talk about it and make sure you can build things that are going to be better. So yeah, I shared a lot of things with you today uh, to try to help push um, accessibility forward. The goal is to give you some example to give you some inspiration of what can be done. You might not always have time to document all of that. So my biggest advice here is pick your battle. If time is limited, document the thing that ha may have the biggest issue or the biggest um, misunderstanding. And at the end of the day, the important thing is it's a team effort. So even if you don't document everything, communication is the most important aspect, like communicating with your, your developers team, the QA, with other designers, so that we can all together <laughs> push accessibility forward and stop fixing it at the end of the project. That's all I have for you. The rest is just resources, <laughs> like all the stuff I talked to you about, and then a big list of links for all, all the tools. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Stephanie. That was awesome. I enjoyed it uh, very much. A lot of that stuff looked pleasantly familiar to me as well. Uh, Lee, do we have any questions queued up? We do. Thanks, Adrian. Um, it's, uh, I wanted to say uh, that, that was so deep and thorough. I think we may actually have an answer to the first question through the last spurt of, of, of dialogue there about collaboration, which is amazing. But maybe uh, we can unpack this a little more. Steph, is, uh, Hossam uh, on YouTube asked about examples for communicating with different stakeholders. And you shared about the different stakeholders from project uh, product manager through to the uh, QA folks. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm curious about that, that maybe uh, extends beyond what you just shared with us is, do you use the same documentation if you're, if you're going uh, across the product team or is there other, other ways that you're communicating with, with product owner versus developer versus QA? No, not at all. With, uh, uh, with stakeholders, it's uh, a different levels. But uh, so for QA uh, and developer, they, I kind of discovered that most of my UX deliverable, like all of those user flow, but I also do a lot of um, information architecture work and all of that where I basically like try to bring patterns into this and they love it. Like we build a native application and the QA guy had just to go through the whole flow and I've almost traced his testing um, scenarios. So a lot of the, the things that we build as designers, I think they're super useful for uh, the dev team, the QA, even the PMs to help them write or the POs who whoever is going to write the stories. And often you have designers who will be kind of 
hiding a lot of the stuff, like all the behind the scene, like the graphs and charts and all of that. But this is valuable information. This is basically you trying to imagine how it's supposed to work. So share it with the team. So definitely, yeah. So all of those things, like designers mock-up and all of that, I share the same with uh, everyone in the team. But yeah, stakeholder level is uh, a whole <laughs> a whole other topic, yeah. And I think, again, you've answered a, a new question from Hossam about one more example of how design should be communicated in case it hasn't been documented, which you described a prototype or, or something along those lines. If you have another example, that'd be great. But, but I think uh, you, you're one step ahead of Hossam's questions. <laughs> so how it should be documented if you don't have time to communicate? Or, or uh, his exact phrasing was, in, if it hasn't been documented, what then? Uh, then I would say you need to talk to the developers because they might have a lot of questions about interaction and uh, maybe it can be documented in the actual style guide. Like if you build a design system, you usually have designer documentation and then you have developer documentation. So it will depend. Some of the stuff I showed here, uh, some of that can also arrive in your design system, like alternative text, things like that. This is already kind of going forward a little bit. So if you have the discussion with the developer as to what are the rules, uh, like how is this supposed to work with uh, keyboard interaction, write it down somewhere. Just take a memo of the, the, the small meeting and keep it somewhere for future reference, something like that. So if you document something, even if it's not super detailed mockups, still have a, a place to store that kind of thing. Because you never know, like maybe you will leave the team or at some point you will be on holiday. And then you, if you've documented it or if there's at least trace of those conversations, you can go on holiday and be sure that, yeah, you, you don't have to overstress about will they build the right thing when I'm not at work? It's like, yeah, sure, they will. So uh, I'll ask you a question here about your role uh, within the product mix. And as a designer and as someone who, who, who wants to deliver an exceptional experience, do you feel like your role ends with the conversations with the developers or QA, or do you feel a need or recommend a process where people continue to be involved as the product is released and, and connecting with either testing or other mm. types of feedback that can come back to you? So I, I'm a UX researcher, which means that at some point, once you've shipped something, you need to measure that it's actually working. So now it doesn't stop once it's shipped. Or, au contraire, like we say, it's like, we, we do a lot of things, like one of the things we do, this is not just accessibility, it's more like um, uh, research and uh, checking with the users, but it is a, when we build those Jira story, we already bake in what we want to track. We have Matomo, which is a tool that we track. And I'm usually like, okay, we're gonna launch this feature, but in six months, if no one clicked that button, we remove it. So I'm like, you know, sometimes you launch something, you didn't do research, you just have a hunch or something. But we're already like baking in some of the tracking we want to put on the button on the feature to make sure it is used as well. And also I am involved in, um, in QA testing. So we have a QA tester who does automated tests. He also does manual tests. And my, my job is to make sure that it looks and works the same the way it was described in, um, in the design. So I also do kind of a lot of testing. Uh, I will not test the data. Like if the data is wrong on a business site, I have no way to know that. But I will check, okay, this button is supposed to be disabled when we do that. And uh, what with keyboard navigation, where we had some stuff where we had keyboard navigation in the, the specs, but it was uh, forgotten or maybe uh, complicated or something like that. So then I will be like, hey, look, we needed keyboard navigation for that. Can we implement it? Do we open a bug? feature it's always big debates is it a bug or is it a task but yeah at some point my role is kind of making sure the quality is there as well you know definitely that's great i think we have time for one quick question we've got uh, a minute here and alberto has asked if a qa tester comes in after the figma designs have been done uh, how does that uh, kind of segue to uh, them having the right understanding of how to validate? Uh, communication again. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's basically like, uh, it's a little bit complicated. In my case, like the, the QI person is also reviewing the story. 
because he has a lot of business knowledge and also sometimes he's like yeah but this that can't really work like that so maybe we need to to re rework something but yeah if the QA person arrives after the, the Figma it can be I think a good thing to maybe if you have a Figma prototype you know now with Figma you can do this kind of click through prototype it can be a good uh, thing to communicate to them as well to say uh, it might not have a um, kind of user flow but look you can just play around with the prototype and then you see what is expected so anything that is already um, interactive prototype I didn't mention that but we build some actual prototypes for uh, usability testing and offer and put those in the um, the, the story is as well, because then people can just like have a sense of how the pages are going to behave, what happens when you click or interaction with a keyboard somewhere. So yeah, definitely the QA person, if they arrive after the Figma um, files, um, Figma mockups are done, they can still like have a conversation with the designer who can explain what's expected. And also maybe you need to tell them what they have to test. If they're not used to test keyboard accessibility, for instance, maybe you need to kind of onboard them on that part as well. Hence the whole matrix, you know, like I did this matrix as what do can I document as a designer? But maybe you could do something um, similar, like what could I document or code as a developer? And what could I test as a QA on my own? And what do I need the help of um, QA specialized in accessibility with at some point, something like that. Thanks so much. Awesome. awesome. This Thanks is the this me. is the part where I get to jump in because we're at time and we need to queue up for our next talk. <laughs> Stephanie, that was great. Lee, thank you for fielding those. Um, for our attendees, if you liked this session, please hit that YouTube like button. It looks like me giving a thumbs up, but without me. Uh, don't forget you can subscribe to youtube.com slash inclusive design24 to be kept in the loop on our future events. A reminder that ID24 is a respectful community. You can find our code of conduct on the Inclusive Design 24 website. Inclusive Design is brought to you with thanks to our supporters, Entopia, Fable, Barrier Break, TPGI, UX for the Win, Equal Entry, Infoaxia, Intuit, Law Office of Laney Feingold, Adrian Roselli, LLC, and WebAble. Inclusive Design 24 will be back on the hour of their next session. We'll see you then. Thank you all. <laughs>